Hello, and welcome to Autocracy Now. This episode, we'll be looking at Huey Long in the Senate. Back in the day, the main form of entertainment was of course the radio, and Amos and Andy was a popular radio sitcom about a couple of best friends trying to make it in the big city of Chicago. The show had some pretty racist undertones, but that was par for the course at the time. Now, it was so popular that in a lot of movie theatres, they'd stop the film halfway through and stick a radio up on the stage so that everyone could listen to the new episode live. One of the characters, Andy, was gullible and constantly on the lookout for get-rich-quick schemes. Enter a smooth-talking schemer called the Kingfish, who was constantly trying to manipulate Andy and scam him out of his money. Huey Long delighted in listening to the programme, and when people started to nickname him the Kingfish, he gleefully encouraged it. If the Louisiana Kingfish was a swindler, though, he just pulled off a pretty amazing grift on the people of Louisiana, having been elected as their senator with a big majority. Moving on to the national stage, though, Huey didn't lose sight of his power base. The next order of business for him was ensuring the line of succession. you remember that Huey had to leave the Senate seat vacant for the first four months, else the Lieutenant Governor, Paul Sear, who despised him, would set about reversing all of his policies as an acting governor. So Huey felt that he had to make sure that his own hand-picked candidate would succeed him, and, in O.K. Allen, a long-time friend and confidant, he had his man. There was only one slight problem. His own brother, Earl Long, wanted to be on the ticket as Lieutenant Governor. Huey said that there'd be too much Long in politics if Earl got involved. The reality is that he probably knew that his brother was too headstrong and impetuous, and unlikely to obey his orders while he was off at the Senate. He felt that he needed all of the powers that he had accrued in the Governor's office, and he had absolutely no intention of sharing them, not even with his own brother. So he refused to endorse Earl, and the fractious relationship between the two brothers fell down another notch. O.K. Allen, meanwhile, well, he knew what side his bread was buttered on. At speeches during their campaign rallies, Huey spent three times as long speaking than Allen did. Sometimes Allen wouldn't even speak at all, leaving it all to Huey. Indeed, whenever Huey came back from Louisiana from the Senate, it's said that Allen would move into a secretary's office in the Capitol building, while Huey would move back to his rightful place in the office of the governor. I'm sure O.K. Allen had some ideas of his own. It's just rather hard to work out what they were. Earl Long used to joke that one time a leaf blew into the Capitol office where O.K. Allen was working, and he signed it because he thought it was from Huey. For quite some time in one party Louisiana, the politics had been split between two opposing camps, completely defined by Huey, anti-Long and pro-Long. Well, O.K. Allen would be the Long candidate. And in the end, the Long candidate would outperform his nearest rival by a nearly two-to-one margin. But of course, because this was Louisiana in the 1930s, there's absolutely no way we're going to get to the end of the election without some ridiculous high drama. In this instance, drama's name was Paul Sear. Probably realising that he had no hope of legitimately winning the election against a Long candidate, Sear sued Long. He argued that by becoming senator, he had naturally forfeited his role as governor. But Sear didn't even wait for the results of the legal process to come in, and had himself sworn in as governor on the spot. Huey, who obviously had a flair for drama himself, reacted um, dramatically to this proclamation, putting his militia on notice and herring down the motorway at 90 miles an hour with a pistol tucked in his pocket. He ordered that the governor's mansion be surrounded by the police in case Sear tried to occupy it. Then, with brilliant cheek, he countersued Sear, arguing that by trying to become governor, he had vacated his office as lieutenant governor. Soon enough, the lawyers found for Huey, and Sear was replaced by the next man in line. Huey now no longer needed to be held hostage by his embittered deputy. In the end, Sear's bizarre attempted coup had nothing that could possibly make it stick. It's easy to see him as irrational and deranged, and difficult to see exactly how he thought this little scheme was going to work. And the people of Louisiana got the joke. Soon enough, dozens of wags showed up at public offices and demanded that I should be sworn in as governor. Sear lost in the courts, and this bizarre challenge to Huey was quickly extinguished. Indeed, the wonderfully unbiased press said that Sear had, quote, about as much chance of being installed or elected governor of Louisiana as a Texas billy goat had of making a non-stop jump to the planet Mars. There's barely ever time to look back when we're following the whirlwind life of Huey, but before we follow him to the Senate, it's worth looking back on his term as governor. The really amazing thing about the Kingfish, compared to a lot of populists and demagogues, is that he did actually manage to achieve some of his promises. The school books had been distributed to every family. Bridges, roads and hospitals had been built. 
Of course, throughout all of this, he had his critics. They mostly attacked Huey for this vast increase in public spending and fiscal irresponsibility. And it was perfectly true that the amount of money spent by the state had shot up. And I'm sure a lot of it had gone into the pockets of Long and his associates as well. In fact, during Huey's term, the state money more than doubled. In 1928, they were spending $29 million a year, while by 1931, it was $83 million. And this wasn't compensated for by the taxes that Huey had tried so hard to force through, which were, in reality, small potatoes compared to this kind of spending. The public debt increased from $11 million to an amazing $125 million, and the situation was so bad that the bonds issued by the state of Louisiana were soon practically worthless. So the charges of fiscal irresponsibility aren't completely without merit. But defenders of Huey Long will point out that, in actual fact, This is exactly what modern-day economics suggests that you're supposed to do in the case of a depression. After all, Franklin D. Roosevelt is about to launch the New Deal, which involved a huge increase in public spending to kickstart the economy, boost employment levels, and, you know, spend your way out of it. And that's what we do in the modern era, too. But it's too far to say that Huey was an economic genius ahead of his time. He just wanted the political gains that this kind of expenditure could bring. And far more damning, we should never forget, that a good deal of the public money wound up funding Huey's political machines, and in the pockets of his cronies. Leaving the state in the capable hands of a sock puppet, Huey went to Washington before his term as governor actually expired. When he was met by a bevy of reporters, they were keen to know, should we call you governor or senator? He simply replied, they call me the kingfish. It's difficult to figure out in the early days who was more curious about whom, Rumours of Huey's exploits and character had probably percolated, even to the senators. And of course, Huey was immediately trying to scope out the political situation, to see who his allies and adversaries might be. I get the sense, even in my limited reading about the politics of the state, that Huey wasn't the typical senator to emerge from Louisiana. They were more used to the establishment, well-to-do, honourable, southern gentleman types like Feather Duster Rancel, not rabble-rousing lawyers like Huey. And the lie of the land in US national politics was very dramatic at this time. This was 1932. People were living in slums dubbed Hoovervilles after the sitting president due to the terrible effects of the Great Depression. Conventional politics seemed to have failed people who had lived through years of hardship. Huey was determined to bring his fiery brand of radical populism to the hallowed floors of the US Senate. And it was just conceivable that, given the times, people might listen to him. But if Huey had imagined that he'd be able to waltz into the Senate, with its reputation for slow negotiations and bipartisan consensus, and dominate it in the same way as he had done Louisiana politics, well, he was in for a rude awakening. Maybe part of the issues were that, in many ways, he was now part of the exact elites that he'd been rebelling against for his entire life. But Huey barely even engaged with the Senate at all to begin with, often rushing back to Louisiana to take care of some business or other. He showed little interest in the committees that he was assigned to, showing up to fewer than half of their meetings, and rarely contributing. And when he was asked about the state of Washington by the folks back home, he railed bitterly against even his fellow Democratic senators. Quote, The Democrats seem like a whipped rooster with the victor pecking us on the head, all standing there, bleeding, taking it. Not that Huey was a non-entity. Indeed, to the senators, he was something of an annoyance, running around in a bright red necktie and brown tweed, as well as ostentatiously monogrammed shirts, the kind of thing that made him stand out from the crowd. There are countless anecdotes of him backslapping a horrified fellow senator and referring to him in over-familiar terms. He stalked around the Senate, constantly in motion, like he was delivering one of his flailing-armed speeches. We've talked in previous episodes about Huey's boorish behaviour being carefully calculated to ensure that his supporters loved him, and certainly he built his career around standing out. But it's also worth bearing in mind that he probably didn't know how he was supposed to act, and some of the disappointment that he seemed to have in the lack of radical energy at the Democratic senators. Well, this is likely genuine. He might have thought that he was on the party of the working class and the common people, and not found them to be that when he got there. And they didn't all take to him either. Indeed, Roosevelt's wife always just referred to him as that awful man. When Huey did speak, he would always divert the theme to his one real core issue of national politics, wealth inequality and redistribution. A few months in, he delivered a dramatic speech entitled The Doom of America's Dream, 
This was the first of the Huey Long dramatic speeches in the Senate that would bring people to come from miles around to hear what he had to say. Here he introduced the first few measures of what would become the Huey Long Share Our Wealth program. Personal fortune should be limited, and the remaining loot divided up amongst the poor. Huey's rhetoric was as soaring as it ever was. Quote, there can be no rule so sure as one that the same mill that grinds out the fortunes above a certain size at the top grinds out the paupers at the bottom. This great dream of America, this light and this great hope, have almost gone out of sight in this day and time, and everybody knows it. End quote. If Huey had hoped to persuade the senators with his rhetoric, though, he was in for some bitter disappointment. No one really seemed especially interested in wealth redistribution, and his speeches instantly marked him as the most radical man in the body. Although they got some positive press coverage, one newspaper said that it was the most impassioned plea on behalf of the impoverished people for years. But all of the amendments that Huey introduced for wealth sharing were voted down by sound majorities. One conservative senator, you can imagine him maybe puffing on a pipe as he said this, said, We always have a wild man in the Senate. We let him blow off steam, and then we tame him. But of course, the whirlwind had no intention of being tamed. It had probably always been clear to Huey that the Senate was just another body that he had to go around. He now had a platform, a national platform, to elevate his demagoguery and popular appeal to the national stage. He didn't want to work with the rest of the Senate, or even with the rest of the Democratic Party. Instead, he wanted to be an alternative to them. The exasperated senators, listening to his wild and passionate speeches about inequality and injustice, were listening to tirades that were only half meant for them. Huey always had one eye on the public gallery. There's one usually reliable way to get people to pay attention to you, and it's one that's worked well for Huey in the past. Do you remember when I told you about how he talked about getting support in some new town or locality? The plan was basically to find the guy in charge and take him down. Then the opposition coalesces around you, and then you could negotiate with the undecideds. Huey never wanted to be a lackey for the man in charge, and so he reserved his most vicious attacks for Joe Robinson, who was the leader of the Democratic opposition in the Senate. And his strategy for attacking opponents on the national stage was practically singing from the Louisiana hymn sheet again. He denounced Joe Robinson as being bought and paid for by corporate special interests. At one point, he listed the corporations that were clients of Robinson's law firm, arguing that his votes had been corruptly bought by these companies. You'll remember that Huey now, he's not really being a hypocrite, because in his legal career, he made it a point of never really working for the big corporate dollars, so he could still smear others as being bought and paid for when he wanted to. Those of you who have been closely following US politics recently will know that there are certain rules in the Senate about disparaging the conduct of other members on the floor. Huey risked being thrown out, as well as alienating the more moderate members of his own party. After all, when they should be united, attacking the Republicans in charge, he was there attacking their own leader. Even if they had access to grind with Robinson, this complete lack of decorum was unlikely to be successful. But you have to remember that Huey is always gunning for the top position, and to sweep to power, he'd have to be a very unconventional Democrat. He had to use his voice. Already, when he spoke to members of the public, he was starting to denounce both parties. He said, quote, They've got a set of Republican waiters on one side and a set of Democratic waiters on the other side, but no matter which set of waiters bring you the dish, the legislative grub is all prepared in the same Wall Street kitchen. But when he wasn't stretching metaphors too far, Huey was engaging in the other great tradition of the Senate. This is one most suited to Huey's political talents. I'm talking, of course, about the filibuster. And yeah, I do love a traditional political filibuster. It's such a great idea. Like Cicero inventing it, all of it, it's brilliant. Um, so I might drool a little bit over this, but never mind. For those of you who don't know, a filibuster is a technique you can use in certain democratic bodies where you have a right to speak for as long as possible in order to draw attention to a specific cause or, more usually, block a piece of legislation in a spectacular, if undemocratic, fashion. You just carry on talking, and talking, and talking. The allotted time for deciding the bill elapses. In extreme cases, a single individual can block legislation by bibbling on for hours on end. And naturally, Huey, with his dramatic, flailing-armed oratory, loved it. During one filibuster, 
I am beginning to be convinced by the logic of my own argument, he said, teasingly strutting around the Senate. I feel the urge to go on and talk some more. Huey regularly deployed filibusters to block key pieces of legislation and draw attention to himself and his Share the Wealth programme. He would often intersperse his speeches with personal attacks and anecdotes. And so his filibusters became his career in microcosm. He strode around dramatically in emotionally demagoguing, wittily talking down his rivals. Meanwhile, the distinguished gentlemen of the Senate looked with increasing disgust and disdain. But in the public galleries, people would flood to see him. Ordinary procedural legislative meetings would turn into a complete circus. People would phone each other from across the city when Huey started talking. A lot of people couldn't accept him as anything more than a sideshow to their serious business. Some were outraged. What's undeniable is that he was impossible to ignore. And for a lot of people, this was the start of something much bigger. So the filibuster is Huey's career. It's the perfect metaphor for his career. Huey may not have won many friends with his gruff, combative, and sometimes downright annoying approach, but he did manage to win one friend in the Senate during his time there. Hattie Carraway of Arkansas was an odd fish for the Senate of the day. Her husband had died in 1931, leaving his Senate seat vacant. The Arkansas political elite got together, they had a bit of a chinwag, and they decided that none of them really fancied the job of serving as senator for a few months, only to then have to fight an election. So they indulged the old southern tradition that let a widow take over her husband's old seat, and Hattie Carraway ended up in the Senate. She wasn't the first female senator at this point because other widows had taken over their husband's seats before. Although she'd never expected to be put in this position, she was far from the placeholder that everyone in Arkansas thought she'd be. She felt a real sense of duty on more than one level, to the base that had voted for her husband, and more broadly. Nor was she willing to stand aside for them to let them ascend to their thrones, declaring, The time has passed when a woman should be placed in a position and kept there only while someone else is being groomed for the job. Huey, who was short on friends anyway, well, he liked Hattie, and he noted that she was regularly one of the few people to vote in favour of his unpopular programmes about sharing the wealth. When Hattie surprised the establishment by announcing that she was running for re-election, and of course was instantly dismissed by all the papers who thought she'd come a distant last, Huey saw his chance to go back out on the campaign trail. He needed all the friends he could get in the Senate. And besides, Arkansas was a good place for him to go politically. It might be that there, a neighbouring state, his populist measures could take root and prove that Louisiana wasn't a fluke. It could catapult him further onto the national stage. And of course, it helped that the other senator from Arkansas was his new arch-rival and punching bag, Joe Robinson. He offered to help Hattie campaign. For her part, eh, she liked Huey, but thought him too radical in a lot of respects. And she was fiercely independent, writing in her diary, I won't give up my vote for anyone. Sitting in this room day after day without the freedom to vote for myself would be beyond pointless for me. So she agreed to accept Huey's help and let him campaign with her. But to her credit, she said that Huey couldn't use it as a platform to attack Senator Robinson, and Huey could never ask for her loyalty in votes. Huey agreed. What followed, in just six days, was described aptly as a circus attached to a tornado. All of the tactics that Huey had honed and perfected in Louisiana were transferred to the people of the neighbouring state. Tons of circular letters in favour of Hattie and Huey's Share Our Wealth programme, they, well, they were all distributed. In their sound truck, they bowled from town to town, attracting ever bigger crowds. Some of them might have shown up just to see the circus, but more than a few of them left convinced that Huey was the next big thing in politics, and willing to support the widow with his endorsement. Huey, quote, I'm here to pull a whole bunch of pot-bellied politicians off this old woman's neck. End quote. The classic mix of Huey's radicalism, smooth talking and humour, was all there. He held up a Bible, arguing that Jesus would have been in favour of sharing the wealth, and that the big men in the Senate thought they knew better than the Lord. One of Huey's proposals was to limit wealth to $1 million, one of the most radical measures ever put before the Senate. But Huey didn't choose to put it that way. Instead, he chose to focus on mocking the poor millionaire. Why, it was awful. That means that if one of these poor millionaires went to bathe and shave, he would only get $500 richer by the time he put his clothes back on. 
Behind the pomp, ceremony and drama, the ruthless efficiency of the long machine in terms of organising these massive campaign events can't be underestimated. At one campaign rally, the crowds that turned up were so large they had to move from the town hall to the baseball stadium. There are some estimates that the rallies Huey held in the state were the biggest meetings that had ever been held in the state period. Again, the establishment hated it, and this just fuels Hattie and Huey's fire. I heard one of Mrs. Carraway's opponents is hollering already, Huey said. I won't mention his name, because he's never had that much free advertising in his life. And my folks told me not to speak ill of the dead, even if they're only politically dead. It did turn out that his opponents were politically dead. When the results came in, Hattie won by a landslide, and became the first woman ever to be elected to a full Senate term. Now it's true that the conditions were quite good for Huey in Arkansas. It also had a population of rural farmers, bitten hard by the Great Depression who were willing to listen to this kind of radicalism. A lot of them knew that Hattie had already been a champion for their interests in the Senate, and they might not have trusted her opponents from the big cities to do the same thing. But the landslide still shocked the Arkansas political establishment. He had shown that Louisiana was not a one-off fluke. By taking his show on the road, and getting some admittedly deserved credit for Hattie's victory, he had begun to inch closer to that national stage. 250,000 folks from Arkansas had seen his passionate speeches about sharing the wealth. Word of Huey was starting to spread beyond Louisiana in a big way. And he knew it. He said that he could take the state in a national election. But it was still very necessary for Huey to maintain his grip on his home state. But it was still very necessary for Huey to maintain his grip on his home state. And in those early days of the Senate, he scored another political coup. His chosen candidate, Overton, won Louisiana's other senatorial seat in an election rife with allegations of corruption, and bitterly fought over the long issue. Once again, everyone knew who the Kingfish had endorsed, and his shadow hung over the contest, even when he wasn't there actively campaigning and stumping for his man. He could perhaps feel that he had three seats in the Senate already. His block was starting to grow. But Huey was not the only great politician to make hay during the deprivations and suffering of the Great Depression. His next opportunity to force his way onto the national stage came when he was supporting another radical up-and-comer, Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Despite some attempts to oppose him from within Louisiana, Huey led the delegation to the Democratic National Convention, where they would pick their nominee for the 1932 presidential election. Huey knew that FDR had a decent chance of winning, and that by supporting him, they could shift democratic politics towards more radical left-wing reforms. FDR had already started talking about helping the forgotten men and sharing in the distribution of the national wealth. Well, that was music to Huey's ears. Huey knew, probably, that FDR did not support anything quite as radical as what he was proposing on the campaign trail. But it was a step in the right direction, and Louisiana's votes had proved important in helping him get through as the presidential candidate. Huey knew a good rising star to hitch himself to when he saw one, and he brought the same type of whirlwind politics to persuading the delegates in the South to vote for Roosevelt. FDR knew that, at this early stage, he could get good numbers of votes from the radical fringes. Endorsements from Huey Long and Father Charles Coughlin, another radical, the radio priest, who proposed dramatic measures to resolve the Great Depression in his popular radio broadcasts. But such men were also dangerous, and for his part, FDR was wary of Huey Long. His naked ambition was all too obvious to a canny politician like FDR. He commented famously, quote, These are not normal times. The people are jumpy and ready to run after strange gods. It's all very well for us to laugh at Huey, but actually we have to remember all the time that he really is one of the two most dangerous men in the country. We shall have to do something about him. End quote. The other most dangerous man, by the way, was General Douglas MacArthur. And to Eleanor Roosevelt, of course, Huey would always be that awful man. Now, there are plenty of others in the Senate who had begun to agree with her and get more and more sick of Huey. As the year wore on and FDR swept to victory, things began to get a little bit dicier for him. It's hard for me to tell from the outside whether he genuinely believed that he was going to be able to win senators around to his radical scheme. Surely he must have realised that a lot of them had far more to lose from supporting this kind of politics than they could possibly gain. It seems like he was always planning on just using his Senate seat to catapult himself into the public eye, 
with greater and greater prominence, until he could go over the heads of the establishment and appeal to the masses as he always had done. But there are genuine signs of frustration in his increasingly bitter and vitriolic attacks on the senators who did not support his bills. He said, quote, You're among the unemployed and you don't even know it yet. Go now, you rich men, Huey yelled, brandishing a Bible, and weep and howl for the miseries that will come upon you. On another occasion, Huey was even more direct about these miseries. A mob is coming to hang the other 95 of you damned scoundrels, and I'm undecided whether to stick here with you or go out and lead it. The New York Times was the epitome of establishment despair at Huey's antics. During one filibuster that took up the Senate for a whole week, they editorialised, No argument moves him. Appeals to reason he despises. Like a slave driver, he cracks his whip over the backs of the Senate. How long will the Senate lie down under his insults? The Republican Party, now in opposition, well, they like nothing better than to let Huey speak and embarrass the Democrats, so he was able to continue his filibusters unabated with their support, and he was starting to alienate nearly everyone in the Senate. He attempted to persuade them of the differences between his Share Our Wealth program and communism. This platform is the only thing that can save you people from communism, he'd cry. But his cries fell on deaf ears. Soon enough, it was time to take his program to the people directly. In a broadcast on national radio in 1934, Huey laid out the terms of his Share Our Wealth program. Although the details were often sketchy and shifting, the basic items remained the same. Personal fortunes would be capped at five to eight million dollars, which works out equivalent to 96 million dollars today. No one would be able to earn over a million a year. Inheritances would be similarly limited. With the money, a guaranteed basic income of $2,000 would be assured for every family. This is at a time when, at the bottom of the Depression, more than half of all families were earning less than that. College education and vocational training would be free for all. Anyone over the age of 60 would get a state pension. The working week would be reduced to 30 hours, and every worker would be entitled to a four-week holiday. It was a utopia. It was a fantasy but people were starting to listen. His appeal went beyond logic. It was deeply emotional. He said, But in the name of our good government, people today are seeing their own children hungry, tired, half-naked, lifting their tear-dimmed eyes into the sad faces of fathers and mothers who cannot give them food and clothing they both need, and which is necessary to sustain them. And that goes on day after day and night after night, when day gets into darkness and blackness, knowing those children would arise in the morning without being fed, and probably go to bed at night without being fed. We do not propose to say that there will be no rich men. We do not ask to divide the wealth. We only propose that, when one man gets more than he and his children and children's children can spend or use in their lifetimes, that then we shall say that such a person has his share. Did Huey really believe that his sums added up? Did he really believe that this kind of system could work in the United States? I don't think we can ever know that for certain. It does seem very idealistic for someone who knew as much about how things really went on, the corruption, backbiting and double dealing of government, to believe that this kind of system could ever sustain itself. At the same time, he had beat the same radical drum for his entire political career, Even from the early days in Louisiana, he had redistributed wealth from corporations towards the public good, or at least portrayed himself as doing that. The only thing we really know about Huey is that, whether he wanted to do it for angelic or demonic reasons, he was hell-bent on getting into power. Take this quote from early in his Senate career, which is pretty revealing. He said, A perfect democracy can come close to looking like a dictatorship. A democracy in which the people are so satisfied, they have no complaint. And then there's his response to the people who dared to question whether share our wealth could work financially. When they said they didn't understand the numbers, he'd say, You don't have to understand, just shut your damned eyes and believe it. This philosophy can be helpful on some occasions, but it's not what you'd call good accountancy. The reality was that, for share our wealth, the numbers didn't add up. 
Not only did it have all the problems of socialism, the implementation problem, the flight of capital problem, corruption issues, but even by successfully confiscating all of the fortunes of the millionaires, Huey would have nowhere near enough to fulfil all of his promises. But reality didn't have to enter into it. Every man a king, and no man wears a crown. It wasn't long before, inevitably, Huey began to break with FDR. The men distrusted each other, and at any rate, Huey was probably concerned that FDR's popularity and success could make it far more difficult for him to become president. FDR was splitting the left, after all. FDR's was the presidency that really started the American tradition of the first hundred days, and FDR's first hundred days were a real barnstormer of a success. They radically altered the direction of the country with the first New Deal legislation. Huey generally supported this famous series of measures that established the Federal Emergency Relief Administration to spend money on soup kitchens, employment, education and food supplies. The vast public works programmes, like the PWA and the Tennessee Valley Authority, they built dams on the Great River, they were all endorsed by Huey. But he made it clear that his endorsement was not uniform, and completely conditional on the politics. He said, whenever this administration has gone to the left, I've voted with it, and whenever it's gone to the right, I have voted against it. The New Deal was reform, and it was a start, but it was nowhere near as vast and sweeping as what Huey had in mind. There were reasons aside from idealism and ideology for the break with FDR, though. With the New Deal, and all of its public works programmes, came a vast influx of federal jobs. Unless we forget, these jobs are the lifeblood of the long political machine, and the currency he traded in. It was absolutely vital for him, in order to maintain his hold on power, that there should be no interruption to this supply of government jobs, the ones that he'd dole out to reward his supporters. But FDR had absolutely no intention of strengthening the long grip on Louisiana. Traditionally, the senior senator, which was now Huey, was consulted before federal jobs were awarded. But FDR broke with this tradition, and the federal jobs were decided on a non-partisan basis. In effect, this meant that most of them ended up going to anti-longs. FDR was hoping to limit Huey's power and have greater federal power. Huey was enraged, and even said, probably only half-joking, that Louisiana should secede from the Union to stop the federal bureaucrats, hobocrats, and 58 other types of crats from running their affairs. Once Roosevelt had denied Huey the patronage he craved, he was just as often an outspoken critic of Roosevelt as he was a defender. He began redoubling his efforts to introduce the Share Our Wealth Bills. The shaky alliance between FDR and his radical friend from Louisiana had lasted less than six months. Quote, no, I will not participate in the Democratic victory tonight, Huey cried after another piece of New Deal legislation was passed. I do not care for my share in a victory that means the poor and the downtrodden, the blind, the helpless, the orphaned, the bleeding, the wounded, the hungry and the distressed will be the victims. It might have been more honest for him to say that he didn't feel like his share in the victory was big enough. Huey feigned a complete lack of concern about the patronage, saying, as far as I'm concerned, they can keep it. And it was true that he had a lot of state jobs, and his increasing popularity to keep him in charge. But Roosevelt denying Huey patronage in the New Deal federal jobs was a big deal for matters in his home state. In fact, it was probably a key factor in shattering the shaky alliance between Huey and the mayor of New Orleans. You'll remember that New Orleans had always been a hotbed for anti-long sentiment. When Huey was elected, it was only the promise of continued patronage and jobs to the old regular machine of New Orleans, and some shaky truces that had gotten the votes he'd received from the capital. With even these jobs looking to go to anti-longs, the mayor, Walmsley, and the old regular machine in the city were fit to burst, and after an attempt to negotiate a pact failed, they broke all political ties with the long camp. Tensions rose dramatically when Huey effectively tried to steal a special election for Congress from Louisiana's 6th district. The seat was left vacant by a sudden death, and Huey tried to announce the election with just one candidate on the ballot, claiming there was um, too little time to hold a primary election. Anti-long mobs burned ballot boxes, and even effigies of Huey himself. For a few weeks there were armed standoffs between Huey's state police troopers and the anti-long forces. Eventually, a somewhat legitimate election was held, 
and the anti-long candidate was successful. But Louisiana politics would continue to be a primary focus of Huey's attention, even as he made his mark on the Senate and the country as a whole. The system had always been corrupt. There had always been unscrupulous people who had abused it. But the polarisation in the state, and the bitterness of the enmities that seemed to surround Huey, meant that things that were once unthinkable were beginning to happen more and more often. Armed force was beginning to have a greater influence on politics. This is the type of situation that you can get yourself into in very divided times. With that, we'll leave Huey Long for this episode. Thank you for listening to Autocracy Now. If you've enjoyed the show, please review us, rate us on iTunes, Stitcher, your favourite podcast network. Spread the word to anyone else who might possibly be interested. You can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, any of those social media things we all love so much. You can email me or direct message me with your questions, comments, concerns, suggestions for improvement. I'm going to tease you a little bit with the title of the next episode. It's called A Long Shot? Our theme music is The Spirit of Russian Love by Zenadia Trokai, and you can find her stuff at costat.bandcamp.com. That's K-O-S-T-A dot I hope you've enjoyed this episode.